ستتين بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حياكم وبياكم أهلا وسهلا uh, Welcome to another class or session uh, from myself uh, Ustaz Ayaz Hawsi sponsored by Jumeirah Islamic Learning Center in Dubai. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. It's a great pleasure to be here again, the first time of the Ramadan. And I'm here on a Thursday weekly session in order to share and to remind our Muslim brothers and sisters out there of what our purpose in this dunya, what we're supposed to be doing, and what we're not supposed to be, what we're not supposed to be not doing, what we're supposed to abstain from. But this is something that we need to know that the main content of the Quran Whatever the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came with, take it. Whatever the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, asked you to, uh, to stay away from, then do not do it. But this is something that I want to speak about inshallah today. Brothers and sisters, uh, We've been speaking about, uh, or we've been talking about uh, Ramadan, and in the month of Ramadan, we've spoken about uh, Salah, Zakah, Umrah, Sadaqah, spoken about uh, all these kind of, of, of good deeds. And in the month of Ramadan, and we know very well that we work a lot on our on our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know Ramadan was a month in which that we strengthen our iman between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ramadan was the month in which we strengthen our iman between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? In order, in order for, uh, for us to be able to, to battle the shaitan after Ramadan. Yeah? The reason why shaitan is being locked in the month of Ramadan one of the reasons is that you can strengthen your iman. Yeah. Once you strengthen your iman, you'll be able to do what? To fight and battle the shaitan after Ramadan. Because in Ramadan itself, we know very well in Ramadan, the shaitan is chained. In Ramadan, we're able to do many of the good deeds. But at that moment in Ramadan, we are strengthening, we are training, we are, we are, 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 we are we're getting ourselves used to be able to stay away from what Allah has forbidden in the month of Ramadan, so that after Ramadan, we're able to carry it out. Yeah? Because subhanAllah, if you look at, at the one of the wisdom of, uh, one of the wisdom of Ramadan, uh, subhanAllah, we are able to, uh, to stay away from food and drink in the month of Ramadan, right? We're not eating in, in Ramadan. We're not drinking in Ramadan, even though it is something halal. Even though eating and drinking something halal, but we're staying, we're staying away from it in the month of Ramadan. So what did that mean? What did that actually, uh, what did that actually uh, brings into mind? If I'm able to stay away from halal in Ramadan for the sake of Allah, that means after Ramadan, I'm able to stay away from what Allah has been haram. You understand? But if in Ramadan, I stayed away from drinking and eating, which is something halal in general, but in Ramadan, it was haram during the day, and I stayed away from it. Everyone stayed away from it. The young, the old, the rich, the poor, the obedient one, and the disobedient one as well. They, they were able to fast in the month of Ramadan. So if you were able to stay away from something halal in Ramadan, which is food and drink, why can't you stay away from something haram outside Ramadan? Something that we need to start thinking about now. Yes or no? So it's something worth speaking about how we can maintain this, um, how we can maintain this, inshallah, throughout the 11th month outside Ramadan, how we can maintain our iman ta'ala. We know very well in the month of Ramadan, we tried our best to please Allah. In the month of Ramadan, we tried our, our best to share our, our wealth to, to the poor. In the month of Ramadan, we read the Quran. In the month of Ramadan, we made a lot of dua. In the month of Ramadan, we obeyed our parents. In the month of Ramadan, we, we spent on our family in a halal way. 
but why do we have to go back? Why do we go back to our normal life, which is, we don't call it normal, we go back to the, to the, to the life of normality, which means that you let share, you allow shaitan to come and interfere into your life. Why do you let shaitan to allow, you allow shaitan to come into your life after Ramadan? It's not something easy, but we're going to speak about it, how we can do that. بإذن الله تعالى what I want to speak about today inshallah is something called al-istiqama al-istiqama is something what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from his slave what is the meaning of istiqama istiqama means to be steadfast istiqama means to be firm Istiqama means that you don't go to extreme and you don't lag behind in your religion. Istiqama means that you keep yourself a medium pace when it comes to your, to your religion between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. Istiqama means to maintain your Iman. Istiqama means to maintain your Iman, your faith. It means that you don't go to the extreme or you don't lag behind. This is what istiqama means. So therefore, we're going to speak about why istiqama is very important and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about al-istiqama in the Quran. You know, have you ever noticed that we do ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for steadfastness? Maybe we're not aware of it. That word istiqama is there in Surah Al-Fatiha. Think about it. We always seek istiqama. What we, you know, you know, I tell you something. You have, you are in a firm and a company, and then only certain time of the year, you work very hard, and the rest of the time, you don't work hard. How the board gonna take it? It's something like a little bit, something not right. They want you to work throughout the whole year at the same pace, to maintain the pace. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do. Let me tell you something. Iman, our faith, goes up and down. Everyone over here, including myself. In Ramadan, we felt our Iman was just right there. Right after Ramadan, we find that it's getting decreased and decreased and decreased. No one over here can deny it. You feel that the change of Iman right after Salat al-Eid. Right on the day of Eid, you feel that your Iman has changed. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself used to ask Allah Azza wa Jalla, Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh, the one who changes the heart from time to time, maintain our heart upon the straight path. Thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Make firm my heart on the straight path. One of the verse, why? Because we are prone to fall into error. We, our nafs, we are prone to fall into error, into sin. The karina, what we have with us, the jinn, what we have with us, each and every one of us have a jinn with them. It's called the karin, your companion. And that companion's job is to make you prone and fall into sin. And during Ramadan gets very weak. 
And after Ramadan, we come back strong again. Therefore, we need to know how to maintain that Qareen. We need to know how to maintain and control, have control over the Qareen. Know that Qareen have control over us. You know what I'm saying? The either verse that we read in Surah Al-Fatiha that probably we're not aware of its real meaning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fatiha that we read at a minimum of 17 times a day. Look at that. You might be thinking, why are you speaking about istiqamah now? It's supposed to be spoken before. The only, the main topic that I speak after Ramadan, the istiqamah. I speak about that on my Zoom. I speak about that when I go on TV. I speak about that if I need to go in the khutbah. I speak about this if I need to go after Ramadan in Shawwal. I speak about istiqama because I know that people need it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al Fatiha Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Maliki Yawm al Deen Iya Kana Budu wa Iya Kana Stain. اهدنا الصراط المستقيم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم Oh Allah, guide us toward Al-Mustaqeem over here in Istiqamah Oh Allah, guide us towards Al-Istiqamah Al-Istiqamah means that Oh Allah, guide us towards steadfastness Oh Allah, make us firm upon the religion Oh Allah, don't make our Iman go down and then you take our life at that point this is called istiqamah. And subhanallah, you will come to know how important istiqamah is in the religion, steadfastness, to be firm in the religion. What is the opposite of istiqamah? Okay, if I'm saying steadfastness means istiqamah, to be steadfast in the religion. The opposite of it is that you leave the deen. The opposite of it is that you become you become religious or you have the love and fear of Allah in Ramadan and then outside Ramadan, it all goes back. You go, go back to normal. Salah is out. Sadaqah is out. Hijab is removed. Sunnah is gone. Beard is shaved. Sunnah, no more. This is what we call, this is called opposite of istiqamah, which means that you're lacking behind. Shortcoming into the religion. Huh? Therefore, we need to understand what is the meaning of al istiqamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim, and you and myself, every day, we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us towards al istiqamah. That is towards steadfastness, ya Allah. Make us firm upon the religion, Ya Allah. After Ramadan, Ya Allah, don't make us go back to the way of shaitan, Ya Allah. Make it easy upon us to obey you. Make it easy upon us to stay away from the path of shaitan. This is what istiqamah means. And we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. For subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in regards to istiqamah, فَاسْتَقِيمُوا إِلَيْهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرُونَ Be steadfast and then seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah told the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتِ Be firm and steadfast like how I commanded you, Ya Rasulullah. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتِ so which means that be firm like how I commanded you to be. So in Islam, we need to be firm. We need to be upon istiqamah every day. We need to build an istiqamah in our life. You know, uh, one of the Sahabi came and told the Prophet Muhammad what is the best thing I can do? Give me, tell me the best action I can do. He said, Qul amantu billah, thumma istiqim. Say that you believe in Allah and be firm upon it. 
say that you believe in Allah. Allah, the creator, the sustainer, the protector, the provider. Say that you believe in Allah, you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. There's none worthy of worship except Allah. You believe that Allah can see you, can hear you, you're going to go back to Allah azza wa jal and be firm upon it. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa he could have said, say amen to billah. Say you believe in Allah, you know, and live your life. No, he said, then be firm upon it. Be firm, be steadfast upon your religion. So this is something that we need to know, my brothers and sisters, in regards to al-istiqamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he told the Prophet Muhammad فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِدْ وَمَنْ تَابَ مَعَكَ And Allah says, فَلِذَارِكَ فَدْعُوا وَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِدْ Allah is commanding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to be steadfast, be firm. So who is saying this? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ajib. Who is being told to do it? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ajib. But this is something that we need to, uh, we need to work on. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma rizqna istiqama fi deen. Oh Allah, I ask you steadfastness in the religion. And I'm going to speak about that one shall towards the end. So now you see how important it is, the importance of istiqama in the religion. When you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mentioned that in Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha, whatever is there in, the, in Surah Al-Fatiha, you know that this is the deen. And Allah Azza spoke about istiqam in Surah Al-Fatiha. Allah Azza told the Prophet Muhammad Then I'm commanding you to be steadfast in the religion. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala even told Musa والسلام, and his brother Harun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa and Harun, so now I have actually I have accepted your dua, so now be firm. When you go to Musa, be firm. Speak to them in a very nice and lenient way and be firm. Be firm in your religion, my brothers and sisters. This is something that you need to, to work on. And I need and I need to work on, on that as well, Amira. We need to work on that as well, everyone. Because if you do not work on your istiqama, on your steadfastness, you're going to fall. You're going to fall into the trap of shaitan. Ajib. But it tells you this, the importance of, of istiqama. Those are the importance of istiqama. We have to have it in our life. Let's say, for example, the brothers who maybe uh, uh, reverted back to Islam. It's not only la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah and be firm upon it. People who are born Muslim, la ilaha illallah, your salah, your zakah, and be firm upon it. Don't wait for any Ramadan for you to be uh, a good person. Don't wait for Ramadan for you to start praying. Don't wait for Ramadan for you to be able to suffer in the sunnah. And then after Ramadan, what happened? One of the reasons why we have Ramadan is for it to be upon istiqamah. The way of attaining istiqamah, the way of attaining steadfastness in the religion, one of the ways is to spend Ramadan. One of the ways is to spend Ramadan. Allah Azza wa Jalla wants your iman to be increased. So he make Ramadan. So you can actually go near to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah Azza wa wants you to go to Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants your reward to increase in your balance. Allah Azza wants you to enter for the door of Rayyan on Yom al Qiyamah. So Allah put Ramadan. So you can fast, so you can make Siyam, you can make your Qiyam, you can read your Quran in order for you to attain that Martaba, that level. But the thing is, after Ramadan, we go back to how we were after, before Ramadan. Then there's a problem. Then there's a problem. You know the ulama what they say? They say, if you want to know how far your Ramadan has been accepted by Allah, look how you were before Ramadan, and look how you were in Ramadan, 
and assess yourself how you are now in Shawwal. How you are in Sha'ban, different person. Ramadan came in, definitely you changed, became a better person. You prayed more, more Quran. And now see yourself after, after Ramadan in Shawwal. Okay, definitely in, uh, in uh, Shawwal, like now, we're not saying that you're going to be the same as Ramadan. We're not fasting every day. We're not making Qiyam every night. But there should be that maintain, that, that, that maintenance of, of Iman. It's not, it hasn't gone back to how it was before Ramadan. No, it shouldn't. At least you have to be that, that changed person you have to be. Same thing when you go for Hajj. If you go for Hajj, you make Hajj, you come back, again you fall into Haram, and your life hasn't changed, then your Hajj hasn't been counted. You need to see a change in your life after Ramadan. Then you, you, know, then you come to know that, yes, Ramadan has helped me. My Ramadan has been accepted. I mean, after what, if you see people, after Ramadan, you know, uh, the Quran is kept up there, it's not open again. The Salah, no more Salah. Uh, those who are wearing hijab, the hijab is gone. Uh, those who are following the Sunnah, the Sunnah is gone. Uh, those who used to give charity and pray in Jama'ah, it's all gone. They are the same person how they were before Ramadan. And now think about it. What happened to my Ramadan? What happened to my Ramadan? Therefore, we need to be someone very, very prudent and, 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 and attentive in our Iman and how it's going. What are the ways of attaining uh, Istiqamah? So now you might be thinking, how do we gain Istiqamah? So we spoke about the meaning of Istiqamah. We spoke about the importance of Istiqamah. Now we're going to speak how we attain istiqama in the religion, and then we're going to speak about the benefit of istiqama, insha'Allah. My brother and sisters out there, I would say, first and foremost way of attaining istiqama is al-ikhlas and al-sawab. What is ikhlas? And what is al-sawab? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَاءَ وَيُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَيُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمَةِ And we have not been ordained except to worship Allah with Sincerity. So the first and foremost way, the first and foremost way of attaining istiqamah is to be sincere in your ibadah. Is to be sincere in each and every of your ibadah. Sincerity is very important, my brothers and sisters. Your salah for Allah. Your zakah for Allah. Your hajj for Allah. Your siyam for Allah. Your uh, spreading of knowledge for Allah. Whatever you want to do for the people, for the good of people, for the sake of Allah. Each and every of the ibadah you do for the sake of Allah. As Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam said, إِنَّ صَنَآتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ For verily my salah, my zakah, my sacrifice, my life, and my death are for who? For Allah. لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ For Allah, the Lord of the universe. Nothing for people. I don't pray for people. I don't donate for people. I don't pass for people. I don't do anything for people. All the ibadah for Allah Azza wa Jal. So first and foremost, your ibadah for the sake of Allah, you feel the sweetness of Iman. This is when one of the ways of attaining istiqamah, steadfast, firm, firmness, steadfast in the religion. Number two, 
is that you do your action according to the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You do your action according to the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't do the action according to you. Don't do your ibadah according to your Mawlana. Don't do your ibadah according to uh, what you heard from the internet. Make sure you do your ibadah according to the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul. Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul, ulil amri minkum. Obey Allah and obey the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ma kana ni mu'minin wa la mu'minatin idha qada Allah wa rasuluhu amran an yakuna lahum al-khiyaratu min amrihim. And if ever the Prophet Allah and the Prophet sallam has brought an order, we, we, we have no choice but to do it. Whatever the Prophet Muhammad came with, take it. Whatever he forbade, stay away from it. This is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is it. Therefore, your action has to be according to the will of the Prophet. You have sincerity in your salah and you pray according to the will of the Prophet. You have sincerity for your zakah, you give it according to the will of the Prophet. You have sincerity uh, towards uh, sincerity in, in siyam, you do it and then you do it according to the will of the Prophet. So it works together. Al ikhlas was sawab, the sincerity and the uh, sincerity and doing it according to the way of the Prophet them, it worked together. You cannot do only one. You cannot have sincerity and then do the ibadah according to your own way. You cannot do your ibadah according to the way of the Prophet them, and then there's no sincerity. It doesn't work. So first and foremost, my brothers and sisters out there, for you to attain ikhlas is that you need to uh, have uh, these two, ikhlas of tawab. Number two, or number three, you want to call it. My brother and sister out there, remember that the door of tawbah is open. Don't think that the door of tawbah was open only in Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved to forgive his slave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved when a slave raised his hand and asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for repentance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had actually put repentance next to success in the dunya and the akhirah. You want to be successful in the dunya and the akhirah, make tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَنَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Then go back to Allah Azza wa Jal. All the salah that you missed, the zakah that you missed, your siyam that you missed, the thing that you fell into, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you and He will forgive you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا تُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ تَوْبَةً نَصُوحًا All those who believe, go back to Allah Azza wa Jal and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sincere repentance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to forgive you. He want you to seek the repentance so He can forgive you. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Allah says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَقْبَلُ التَّوْبَةَ عَنْ عِبَادِهِ وَيَعْفُوْ عَنِ السَّيِّئَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يَقْبَلُ التَّوْبَةَ He accepts your tawbah. So why do we feel that? Why do we feel shy to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawbah? Knock at the door of Allah azza wa jal. It's not that the door is closed, the door is always open. 
points of the salaf, early predecessors, uh, subhanAllah, he was feeling very, very bad, very sad. And then the other sheikh told him, go and knock at the door of Allah. Allah will open your way. Go and knock at the door of Allah. You know what he said? He said, since when the door of Allah Azza wa Jal was, was closed, so that I should go and knock it. So the door of Allah is always open. The door of Tawbah is always open. You don't need to go knock at it. It's always open. The problem is we don't go through it. That is it. Keep on asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to repent, to forgive you. You fell into the sin again, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you again. And again, and again. And again, and then the, the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, and I commit the mistake again, and I ask forgiveness, will Allah forgive me? He said, the more you ask, the more Allah will forgive you. Allah says, Ya ya Allah says, Qul ya asrafu ala anfusihim la min Allah says in the Quran, all those people who have done wrong to themselves, all those who have fallen into haram, لا تقنطهم الرحمة الله Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. And what is the mercy of Allah over here? The repentance. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا For verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all the sins. Whatever you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive. If you ask for forgiveness, Allah will forgive you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَن يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَانِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgive all the sin except those who fall into shirk. If you fall into shirk and then you do not ask for forgiveness, then Allah will not forgive you. Apart from that, the door of forgiveness is open. Open. Call upon Allah. Oh, Allah, forgive me. Oh, Allah, you know my shortcomings. Don't ask me about it on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, delete all my, my bad deeds. Ya Allah, even the, the bad deeds that have been put in my trash bin or, or, or how do you call it, in the trash, uh, in your recycle bin, Ya Allah, everything erased. And Allah will erase them. Full delete. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is ready to do that. And Allah subhanahu, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allahu, inna Allah shaddu farhan bitawbati ahadikum. For verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes the happiest, you know when? When you actually raise your hand and ask for forgiveness. Allah azza wa jal, in the last third part of the night, every night, not only Ramadan, every night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come and then he says, من من مستغفر فأغفروا له من من تائب فأتوب عليه Where are those who are asking for forgiveness so that I can forgive them? Where are they? Allah says, where are those who are, uh, who has committed mistake and they want to repent? Where are they? I'm here to, to accept the repentance. But at that moment we're sleeping, last third part of the night. Allah comes for my brothers and sisters out there. Number one, sincerity. Number two, your action to like your action for, uh, uh, do your action like the Prophet Muhammad. Number three is still far with Tawbah. A Tawbah, a Tawbah. You know, let me tell you something. And I always say that. Each and every Bani Adam commit mistake. Everyone, we all commit mistake. If we don't commit mistake, then maybe we're not human beings. The only one who don't commit mistake is the, are the angels. They do things what they've been commanded to do. And as for us, we have free will. Either we do the halal or the haram. And we're going to fall into haram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened the door for us to make tawbah. So we can make tawbah. Has anyone over here? Has it fallen into haram? 
Even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, if you don't commit sin, Allah will wipe you away. We'll make you commit sin and Allah will make you uh, ask for tawbah. For very really, let me tell you something. When Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala speaks about tawbah in the Quran, after it, Allah speaks about Jannah. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, in regards to, let's say, one of the verses I just read now, why did Allah, why does Allah speak about Jannah after he speak about, 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 about Tawbah? In order to let you know that the people who enter Jannah, they're the people who commit sin and they made Tawbah to Allah Azza wa Jannah is filled up with people who committed sin and then they made Tawbah to Allah Azza wa Jahannam is filled up with people who committed sin and never repented to Allah Azza wa So put that in your mind. Jannah is filled up with people who committed sin, committed mistake. But then what they did, they repented to Allah Azza wa Jal. What did Allah SWT say? When Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu tubu in Allah tawbatan nasuha. عَسَى رَبُّكُمْ أَنْ يُكَثِّرَ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ وَيُدْخِلَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ All those who believe, turn back to Allah Azza wa Jal, go back to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala with sincere repentance. عَسَى رَبُّكُمْ أَنْ يُكَثِّرَ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ Perhaps that Allah is going to forgive all your sins. And then admit you to paradise where the rivers flow underneath the ayah. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. When you look at it, it's about Jannah. Make tawbah to Allah. And Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. Allah loved those who goes back to him in repentance. And he loved those who purify themselves. That's the, that's the verse of it. Inshallah, we can speak about the topic of istighfar and tawbah one day. But this is one of the aspect and key of istiqamah. People making tawbah to Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your way. Number four. Muhasabat al-nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Hashar, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Allah wal tanzur nafsumma qaddamat lighadin wa attaqu Allah inna Allah khabiru bima ta'amanun All those who believe fear Allah, have the love of Allah, have, mercy, have hope of Allah Azza wa Jal. And see what you have, what your hand has sent forth forward. See how you are in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Look at your salah, look at your zakah, look at your hajj, look at your siyam, look at yourself in the eyes of Allah, look at yourself in the eyes of people. And then you see, you can actually judge yourself before you're being judged by Allah Azza wa Jal. Like Umar bin Khattab said, Hasabu and Fusakum qabal and Tuhasabu. You know, remember Khattab said, you know, when you know, uh, uh, judge yourself, yeah, judge yourself before you're going to be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So look at, at what you're working. Look at the money that you're bringing in. Look at what you're actually uh, uh, spending in your family. Look at how you're spending your money. How are you getting it in, which means halal or haram? How are you spending it halal or haram? What kind of transaction you have in halal or haram? Look at yourself. Look at what you have sent forth. What you have actually, uh, what kind of secret you have between you and Allah Azza wa Jal that nobody knows. Nobody knows. On Yom Al Qiyamah, that book gonna open, mashallah. This is a secret of sadaqah, a secret of, of, of a tahajjud. A secret of, of, of fasting. Nobody knows. It's only you and Allah Azza wa Jal. So look at yourself. This is how you attain steadfastness in religion. 
not only Ramadan, Islam not only Ramadan, it is in Ramadan and it's in order for you to make you a better person outside of Ramadan. So we said number one, sincerity. Number two, we said uh, to do according to the word of the Prophet Sallam. Number three, we said Tawbah. Number four, we said to look into yourself, Muhasibat al nafs Number five, my brother and sisters, which is something very important, and one of the things that I was speaking about yesterday in uh, one of the masjid in regards to your prayer. Unfortunately, <laughs> that, that, that's pretty sad. You know, now it comes into action. You know, we spoke about sincerity, it's something to do between you and Allah inside. We spoke about tawbah between you and Allah, something inside. Yeah, we spoke about uh, checking out yourself, something mental, something between you and Allah inside. Now we're going to get to physical now. I mean, my brothers and sisters out there. As salah, as salah, wa malakat aymanukum. Your salah, your salah, my brothers and sisters. This is what will give you sakina, tranquility, love, success in this dunya. As salah, as salah will give you success in this dunya and the akhirah. As salah, as salah will give you tranquility and harmony in this dunya and the akhirah. Ajib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qad aflah al mu'minun alladhina hum fi salatihim khashi'un. The mu'min, the successful mu'min, are those who are punctual in their salah. The mu'addin says, Hayya ala salah, hayya ala al falah, come towards salah and come towards success. So in salah there's success. Allah says it, and the Mu'addin says it every day, five times in a day. And he repeated twice. To remind you that after salah, there's success. You want success in the dunya? It's salah. And we hear it, we listen to it, we repeat it. Do we take into consideration? A salah is what you're going to be asked on Yom al Qiyamah. My brother and sisters out there, if you're making zakah, you're making siyam, you're making hajj, you're giving sadaqah, you're feeding the pool, you're doing whatever good deeds you're doing and your salah is not there, it is all in vain. If your salah is not good on Yom al Qiyamah, not Boba, your other, your, any, other, any, of, any other of your good deeds. A salah is what Allah has told, the, brought the Prophet them to the seventh sky and then gave it to him as a gift. A salah, subhanAllah, uh, when you look at it, the Prophet Muhammad them, lost his wife Khadija. The Prophet Muhammad them, lost his uncle Abu Talib in a year. Very sad. And Nabi them, uh, migrated, you know, he left. Uh, Mecca, and then he went to Medi he went to Taif. He went to Taif for what? In order to feel peace and sakina because he lost his, his wife and he lost his uncle. So he went, he decided let's go to Taif in order to do another mission of, of, of propagating Islam again. Mecca, I can't do it. When he went there, he was pelted. He was <clears throat> being removed from the, was being tortured in the village. He went back to Mecca. And Allah Azza wanted to give him peace and sakina and sukoon and, and love and tranquility. What did Allah do? Allah brought him to the seven sky and gave him the salah. And after that, he migrated to Medina and today Islam is in each and every corner of the world from the salah. Success. Islam became successful after the obligation of salah. So it tells you how important it is. And like how I was saying yesterday, and I repeat it again, a minute we have already seen it, something that we think about. We know shaitan has come out, but we cannot just always say that it is the, uh, it is always the, 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 we blame the shaitan for it. We were able to wake up for suhoor, now we can wake up for salat al-fajr. We have to put it in our mind, we can do it. We can do it Asr, Maghrib, Isha, uh, 
Zuhar, we can do it. I mean, we're praying 20 rak'ah of taraweeh, 8 rak'ah of taraweeh. Yes or no? We were able to do it. And now what? We can't go for Salat al-Isha. We feel heavy to go for Salat al-Maghrib. For subhanAllah, the masjid was full in Ramadan. People will make iftar and run to the masjid. Masjid was full. Maghrib, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr. But after Ramadan, what happened? Where are they? I mean, where are they? This is what we're asking now. I mean, did Allah Azza ask you to pray only in Ramadan? That's what I always tell people. You're not supposed to be praying only in Ramadan. You pray in Ramadan and outside Ramadan. Be the slave of Ar Rahman. Not the slave of Ramadan. Be the slave of Allah. Don't be a slave of Ramadan. Allah did not put Ramadan and only for you to, Allah did not create you to pray only in Ramadan. La Allah. Something very important, my brothers and sisters, that our salah for the sisters out there, inshallah, easy. You hear the adhan, make your wudu and pray on time. The brothers over there, if you're in a place where you, if you, are, you hear the adhan, make sure you go and pray in the masjid. Wherever you are in your office, if you feel you cannot go out to the masjid, at least you make sure that you pray at the place at the right on time. There's nothing called delaying your salah. There's nothing called you pray at the night, you replace all your salah, qada, whatever. There's nothing like that. I mean, if the sahaba on the battlefield, they had to pray on the battlefield. Look at that. They're fighting. They're fighting. Allah had actually given them a way of praying on the battlefield. A party pray, and the next party stand up in, in, in Qiyam. When the next party go down to, to sujood, the other party get up and do the qiyam. Even in, jih in jihad, we say, while the fight is going on, you still pray. And now what about us? We're on bed. We're running behind the dunya. Or we're working. Or we got meeting. Or I need to cook. Or I need to eat. I need to finish my assignment. I need to do this, I need to do that. But what comes priority? Your salah is your priority, my brothers and sisters. Make sure that you make your salah as your priority in your life. You will see your life will change. Allah will bring people around you that love Allah and you will love them. Your salah is what makes you who you are. Because your salah is the relationship between you and Allah. Your, your salah is the relationship between you and Allah. You become a different person. Because you are the people of Salah. Therefore, my brothers and sisters out there, remember that a Salah was not ordained on the Ramadan. Just ordained in Ramadan and outside Ramadan as well. Number six, Talab al-Ilm. Seek knowledge. For you to be upon istiqama, seek knowledge. Seeking knowledge is very important. Get to know how to pray the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Get to know how to give your sadaqah. Get to know how to deal with people. Get to know how to deal with the Muslim and the non-Muslim. Get to know how to integrate moral values into your life. Patience, forgiveness, tolerance. Uh, how you can be grateful. How to integrate into your life from the sin of the Prophet Sallallahu Be a different person for where you cannot be Someone pleasing to Allah if you got no knowledge. Because shaitan, one of the tools of shaitan is jahl, ignorance. He make you hate reading. He make you hate listening to good talk. He make it look, sound like a burden for you. But therefore, therefore, my brothers and sisters out there, seeking knowledge is something very, very important. You need to know what, what, what you're doing and where it's going to drive you. What the consequences of something? Seeking knowledge, something very, very important, my brothers and sisters. Number seven, to be upon istiqamah is to choose your friends. Is to choose whom you, you having a company, whom you actually befriending. Remember that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Al mar'a ala din khalili, fayanzur man yukhalil." المرء 
For verily the man or a person is upon the faith of his friend or her friend. So let him see whom he's befriending. You might have a righteous father, a righteous mother, a pious family, but let me tell you something. You're always prone to follow the faith of your friend. You may, you may, you may uh, catch the behavior of your friend as compared to your brother and sister and your mom and dad. Why did the kids' uh, behavior change when they go to school? It shows you how, how, how the, 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 the behavior of their friends uh, affect theirs, how they become a mirror of their friends. That's us as well, even when we are big, we grow up, our accent change, way of dealing change. It's not like how we are in the house. It's not like they're looking at the father and the, and the, and the, and the mother. They're looking at their friends outside. Automatically, you tend to start following what they do. If they pray, you pray. If they smoke, you smoke. If they haram, you do haram. If they share and care, you share and care. This is how it is. But therefore, فَلْيَنْظُرْ مَنْ يَخَالِلْ So look whom you're actually befriending. Because let me tell you, your friend, and يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ If you're the good one, it will be someone who will help you in يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, الْأَخِنَّاءُ يَوْمَئِذٍ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوٌ إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ Your friends on that day will be an enemy to you, except those who used to fear Allah. Those who do not, who used not to fear Allah, on that day they'll be an enemy for you. They won't know you. On يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ but those who used to love you for the sake of Allah, those who used to advise you for the sake of Allah, those who when you see them, you think of Allah. When you see them, it reminds you of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Those are the friends that you need to befriend. <clears throat> These friends, when they don't see you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, they will ask for you. You remember one of the time we made a session of, of Shafa'ah? We spoke about your good friends are going to ask about you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And Allah will ask them to go and bring, your, uh, bring him from, Jan from Jahannam. Your good friend will say, Ya Allah, for verily he used to make salah with, uh, with me. He used to make siyam with me. He used to make hajj with me, Ya Allah. And I don't see him. And Allah will say, go and bring him away from, uh, go and bring him away from Jah Jahannam. Bring him here <coughs> in Jannah. Those are your true friends. So we'll check whom you're befriending. Make sure whom your kids are befriending. See whom your children are befriending. For verily, it has a big impact on their upbringing. As well as number eight is to uh, remember that whatever you do and whatever you say, whatever you hear, you're going to be responsible. You know, there's something that you hear people always say in Ramadan, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. Uh, they want to backbite someone, they say, oh, no, 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 I'm fasting, astaghfirullah. They want, to, they want to lie, they're like, no, 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 in Ramadan, I'm not going to lie. Oh, they want to do something haram, they're like, no, it's Ramadan, I don't want to do it. Oh, in Ramadan, I won't steal. In Ramadan, I won't lie. In Ramadan, uh, I won't, uh, I won't, I won't hit, I won't, I won't bully, I won't slander, I won't cheat. But why only in Ramadan? And outside Ramadan, you can do it. Who gives you the permission to do it outside Ramadan? No one. The same Lord who made it haram in Ramadan, he made it haram outside Ramadan. So whatever you do in your mouth, with your ears, with your, with your eyes, or whatever, with your hand and your feet, in Ramadan, outside Ramadan, you're going to be responsible for it. So it's called a hifz al-jawarih, to protect your limbs and your action. And number nine is to know the trap of shaitan. To know the trap of shaitan. What are the tricks of shaitan? What are the trap of shaitan? Yeah? 
So you need to know that. You're sleeping during the night. You want to wake up for Fajr. You're not able to, it's from Shaitan. You want to swear at someone, it's from Shaitan. You get upset and then you want to divorce your family, it's from Shaitan. You, uh, you want to fall into haram from Shaitan. You know, you want to go for Salat of Dhuhr and then you say later, later, later from Shaitan. So you need to know the trap and the tricks of Shaitan in order for you to be able to, to be upon istiqamah. So therefore my brothers and sisters out there, let me tell you something, SubhanAllah. These are the, uh, these are the, SubhanAllah, ways of getting near the uh, istiqamah. When I'm saying all oh, this, it's not that we are going to, we need our Iman to be right up there. It didn't mean that our Iman need to be right there. It's not, it's not always like this. It goes up and down, up and down. Like the Prophet Muhammad said in Hadith that our Iman is like a feather in the middle of the desert, like a feather. A wind comes, it blows it up, it goes up, and then when, when the wind stops, it goes down again. So we need to know how to maintain it. We just need to know how to maintain it. So inshallah, once you maintain it, Allah Azza wa will give what you need. And subhanAllah. So what we spoke about, to make it clear, to make it a, a quick uh, uh, thing, we spoke about the way of gaining steadfastness in religion is that to be firm in the religion is that you do your action with sincerity, you do it according to the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yeah? And then you make sure that you make your tawbah, make sure that you make your tawbah. Number four, see yourself where you are in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Number five, make sure that you have your five daily prayers right on time. Number six, seek knowledge. Number seven, see that your good friends. Number eight is to protect your limbs and your action from doing haram. And number nine, uh, eight or nine, or I don't know where I reach, is to know the traps of shaitan, you know the trap of shaitan. And as well as my brothers and sisters out there, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram in the religion, it is still haram even outside Ramadan. Whatever Allah has made halal, it is halal in Ramadan, outside Ramadan. So therefore, one of the things that, I, you know, unfortunately, Mm. The tea is cold now. The thing, uh, what, what we need to do is, what, it, and it, it's very unfortunate that you see brothers out there in Ramadan, mashallah, in the masjid, and you see them, mashallah, that you like, mashallah, this brother after Ramadan, he's going to be like, mashallah, those brothers who, you know, proper change. But you see them, you see them, uh, they, you see them, what happened? They, they change. And the brothers who are there who were not wearing shorts, you see them walking out with their shorts. As at Ramadan. In Ramadan, they will not walk out with, you know, you, you can't wear a short and go outside. You are a Muslim. You need to cover your aura. You need to cover your aura. Your aura is from your belly button to your knee. Why in Ramadan you don't go outside with your short? And in Ramadan, outside, outside Ramadan you go out with your short? No, it's haram, it's haram. You can wear that in front of your wife. If you're a mahram, no problem. Yeah, in front of your wife, you can wear that with a short. But apart from that, no, every time, wherever you go, from your belly button until your knee has to be covered, that's for the man. And, and what I'm talking about now, the identity of a Muslim. And the sisters out there, you don't wear the hijab on your Ramadan. You don't wear the hijab on your Ramadan. You wear that in Ramadan, outside Ramadan. I mean, your makeup, what you're wearing every day. I mean, your, 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 your I mean, the, the thick makeup that you wear. Why in Ramadan, mashallah, you see the sister, they don't wear it and after the Ramadan, why? 
That means you are certain that it is something wrong. I'm not saying that to wear makeup. I know, I know, I know, Michelle says, oh, well, you're gonna, you want to beautify yourself. I said, yeah, you do that for your husband. You do that for the, for the, uh, for the people at your mahram in the house. But to go outside and then to, to, to wear some kind of makeup in order to attract people, this is something in Ramadan and outside Ramadan is haram. The hijab has to be worn. It's supposed to be worn. Your, 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 your clothes as a sister has to be loose. That is it. We need to have a proper Muslim identity. I am a Muslim and this is how I wear. Not only in Ramadan. In Ramadan and outside Ramadan. Islam is easy, my brothers and sisters. Everything is halal in Islam, except though what Allah has made haram. And there's more rules and regulation we need to do. That's it, simple. If we're able to abide by the rule and regulation of the, of, the, of, the, of the country where you are, we've got a constitution which is called the Quran, which is for the benefit of the dunya and the akhirah. What we leave this one for? Uh, this is something that we need to put into practice, my brothers and sisters. Well, you could see, mashallah, the sisters, and some of the I noticed as well that the sisters, they don't wear, you know, one today, I think today I saw one sister wearing some long nails. Ramadan, they might not wear long nails, and now they're wearing long nails for what that? What's happening? How, how do you go to the washroom? Why are you wearing long nails with a with no nail polish for? Outside, outside, walking outside, and you got a hijab on. So, therefore, we need to know all these. Don't let shaitan, don't let shaitan steal our rewards. Don't let shaitan steal our rewards. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, this is about istiqamah. This is about to maintain our, our, our relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal on a medium level. Don't go down after Ramadan. Keep it, maintain it. And this is called istiqamah. Let me tell you something. Do you know the benefit of istiqamah? The benefit of istiqamah, my brothers and sisters, all what we mentioned now, all these nine points we mentioned, the importance of it, the meaning of it, and how do we get istiqamah? The benefit of istiqamah is here. And one of the verses that I love a lot, and one of the verses I love to read in Surah Al in, 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 in the Salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Fussilat, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ Those people who say, our Lord is Allah, that's me and you. We all say that. Now, where we are on that platform now, we have 23 people, everybody says that. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Those people who say, our Lord is Allah, and then they affirm in the religion two conditions. You say you believe in Allah and you are firm and steadfast in the religion. Hmm. Then what happened? Those who say the Lord is the Lord is Allah and they affirm in the religion, what happened? تَتَنَزَّنُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا What happened to them? The angels come down to them at the time of death and tell them, don't fear and don't be sad. Those people who say, my Lord is Allah, and they affirm the religion, the angel come down before they die, and then the angel tell them, don't fear and don't be sad. And the angel say, And for you is Jannah of what you have been promised. Ajib. look at that. You say la ilaha illallah and you affirm upon your religion, 
The angel come down to you before death. And then they tell you, don't fear and don't be sad. And for you is Jannah. Ajib. What a good news. What are the conditions for it? The condition is, you say, La ilaha illallah. And then you are firm upon that belief. Simple. All the nine things we mentioned, do this. You will get the angel come to you before you die saying this, inshallah. And then what they say? نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنْفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ نُزُلًا مِنْ غَفُورِ الرَّحِيمِ we are your protector in this world and the akhirah. Who are saying this? The angels. Why? Because you were upon istiqama. And for you is whatever you desire. And we are people, we are angels who has come from the most gracious, the most merciful, and the most forgiving. Look at that beautiful result of being upon istiqama you prayed in ramadan you, you carry on again you kept on praying you had your hijab on you carry on your hijab you feared allah you carry on your fearing of allah your sincerity you carry on your sincerity allah akbar so therefore my brother and sister it's very very important so you see the the benefit of of having istiqama steadfast in their in religion the angel come to you before you die, and then they give you the, the glad tidings of Jannah. Allah. And they tell you, we are going to be your companion in this dunya and the akhirah. They're going to be your companion in your barzakh. They're going to be your companion until you enter Jannah. Allah Akbar. Why? Because you had istiqamah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the people who have istiqamah, inshallah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easier upon us. And we can even ask Allah Azza wa Allah marzukh al-istiqama. Even Umar bin Khattab used to ask Allah, oh Allah, provide us with istiqama. Allahumma urzukni al-istiqama. Oh Allah, provide me with istiqama. Allahumma urzukni al-istiqama fi al-deen. Oh Allah, make us among the people who have istiqama in the religion. The dua that we always need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma urzukni al-istiqama fi al-deen. Oh Allah, make us at fast in the religion, Ya Allah. There's something that we need to ask each and every time. Allahumma rizuqan istiqama in English, in Arabic, in, 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 in Urdu, in Malayalam, in whatever language you speak to Allah Azza wa Jal. Say it, Allahumma rizuqna al istiqama fi deen. Something very, very important. So, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, I'm going to check your question. If you have any, you can unmute yourself. Oh, I'm going to check the chat, bi'idhnillah ta'ala. Okay, it seems we've got some here. Okay, question number one. Okay, Uthman, this very beneficial. What advice to brothers who do not prefer in the masjid? But pray all the salah in the masjid. Uh, let me tell you something. The, the, the salat al fajr, uh, we know that salat al fajr, you know, at, uh, out of all the salah, the out of all the salah in the masjid when you go, that is the time where you find out that the masjid are most empty. Salat al fajr, and we know that the people have the habit now of putting the alarm for their work, and then they don't put the alarm for salat al fajr. And this is something that well, you do find it every time. So what we need first and foremost to ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Ya Allah, make it easy upon me to pray salat al fajr. Ya Allah. Make it easy upon me to pray Salat al-Fajr. So, and then number two, you make your proper intention when you go back to bed. Your intention is to wake up for Salat al-Fajr. You put your alarm. And then, of course, you go to bed early. Yeah, so Salat al-Fajr is something that we need to always be very careful because the Prophet Muhammad said, Man ghada ila masjid urah, a'adda Allah wa la'unuzna fa jannah. 
كلما غدا او راح the prophet said whoever goes to the masjid in the night whoever goes to the masjid in the night allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built for him a house in jannah every time he goes and come back but this is something that very very important and we had to know as well that the angel the angel that change during the day and the night to write our deeds the one of them come at fajr time and, the, and then he leaves at asr time another one come at asr time and leave at fajr time and then when they go to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah asks them even though he knows Allah asked them, how did you leave my slave? If he was sleeping, he said, Ya Allah, I left him while he was sleeping. And I went to him while he was sleeping. If you were praying, he would say, Ya Allah, I went to them while they were praying. And I left them while they were praying. Therefore, Salat al-Fajr, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man Salat al-Burdain, dakhla jannah. Whoever prays Salat al-Fajr and Salat al-Asr will enter jannah. Therefore, Salat al-Fajr is very, very meritorious and rewarding. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever prayed the two rakah of sunnah before Salat al-Fajr, is better than the dunya and whatever is in it. And it, only praying the sunnah of Salat al-Fajr is better than the dunya and whatever is in it. So imagine the two rakah of Salat al-Fajr itself. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we need to know <clears throat> intention, intention is very important. And we know that it's pretty hard for many people. It's something that you need to work on it and you need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy upon you to pray Salat al-Fajr on time and in the masjid. Is kuhul fine to wear outside? Kuhul, the Prophet Muhammad used to wear kuhul. Uh, the Sahaba used to wear kuhul. And then they used to wear that go. It has benefits. Benefit number one is that it clears the whitish of the eyes. Number two, it is a beauty as well. Especially the Sahaba used to wear that. And it is totally fine to wear, to wear the kuhul. But for the ladies, if it is in a way, it is worn in a way that is attractive, then it should not be worn. It is, if it is worn in a way that is normal, it's not attractive, something normal inshallah if it is attractive they should not be worn it can be worn only in the house and it is good to wear the kuhul even for the men before they go to bed that is the best time to can you hear this please for me that is the best time shukran to wear salat uh, to wear your kuhul before you go to bed and it can work on your eyes so this is something how we wear kuhul inshallah okay Okay, another question. Is there any rule that every man who is responsible for taking a family can lead all five prayers in the residence for all his family? No, there's no rule for that. But the thing is, the one, the, the, the question is, is the one, the men of the house supposed to lead the house in the, the people in prayer, in the, in the praying in the house? Should the men lead them? Yes, the men have to lead them in prayer. The men has to lead them in prayer. But if the, the, any of the children knows more of the Qur'an than they, they, by the permission, they can lead the prayer as well. The kids who have more Qur'an, insha'Allah. But the first and foremost, the owner of the house, he is the one who leads them in prayer, insha'Allah, if they're praying at home. Shaykh, after committing a sin, and then we pray to Raka'a al-Salah, when Allah forgive us, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever, Whoever commit a sin and then he perform wudu and then he pray two rakah of salah, which is called salat al tawbah, he asks Allah for forgiveness, Allah will forgive him. Therefore, even this is a way of getting your sin forgiven. Shukran. Sheikh, I saw a video where a sheikh said that if your nose is big, if your nose big, and we are insecure about it, then it is permissible in Islam to get surgery to make it small. Is it true? Anything that goes back to uh, anything that, <laughs> that anything that goes back to the norm, it is okay. It is okay to do so that goes back to norm. For example, if you have a normal nose and then you want to make it pointy, that's not, uh, that's not permissible. But if ever there's a defect in your nose and then you want to make it, uh, you want to make it normal, that's totally fine. If ever you have a defect in your lips, a defect in your lips, and then you want to, that's totally fine. Because it did happen at the time of the Sahaba that the one Sahaba, his nose was cut. And then he was asked to put a metal one. That's totally fine. If ever you, something happened, you fell down, and then you have your 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 tooth, your teeth has been broken, then you can actually put a false teeth. That's totally fine. Anything that 
is abnormal and you know to make it back to normal is totally fine. But to change the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal, and that is not fine. Allah Ta'ala A'lam. Shaykh, is it more rewarding to pray the Fajr Sunnah at home for guys that bring the Sunnah? Yes. For the man, it is Sunnah to pray the Sunnah in the house and then go to the Masjid. It is Sunnah. You pray the Sunnah in the house and then you get the Masjid. This was reported by Aisha عنها, that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would pray the two Sunnah in the house and then he would go and lead them in prayer. So the best and the more reward is to pray inside the the house and then you go into the masjid but if there's no problem praying in the masjid as well inshallah no problem Sheikh, is it a sin if a woman did not wear hijab but wear modest clothes yes it is a sin my sister allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you to wear the hijab and you need to wear the hijab and the hijab is not something on the head like what i'm wearing now this some people might think this is hijab or something Hijab not only covering the hair. Hijab is something that from the hair until the whole body, which means that you need to have in a way of, you need to in a way that you actually have nothing that is taking the shape of your body. Like not attractive. So you wear your scarf, you wear a dress that is loose, this is called hijab. You don't wear attractive makeup, this is hijab. Hijab means a barrier between you and the fitna of the non-mahram. This is called hijab. Hijab means a barrier. So if you're wearing loose clothes without covering the hair, it doesn't make sense. If ever you're wearing hijab and then tight clothes, it doesn't make sense. It's not hijab. The hijab what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is the hijab of that when people see you, there's no uh, kind of temptation. Even though you're wearing, let's say you're in a country where they wear, it's known to be wearing white, uh, black hijab and abaya. But you decided to wear a pink one. You become attractive. This is not hijab again. So hijab is something, everything that you do that is not attractive. Even though if it goes according to the culture, no problem. Let's say, for example, you go in a country where they wear, everybody wears blue. And if you wear blue, if you wear blue abaya, blue hijab, you're not going to be attracted, so then you wear it. Let's say here in Emirat, they all wear, the majority wear, wear black abaya over here. If you go outside with a pink one, everybody going to see you, wow, mashallah, then this is, it goes against the, it defeats the purpose of hijab. I'm not trying to make it difficult over here, but this is a, a, a respect what Allah has given ladies that can be protected. Does that include major sin as well? Uh, any tawbah that you do, sincere tawbah, yes, include major and minor sin. Any tawbah, any tawbah that you do sincerely, both major and minor sins. So no matter how big sin you have committed, and then you sincerely repent to Allah, Allah is going to forgive you. No matter which sin you do. Even though you, you, you made shirk, but then you offer forgiveness, Allah is going to forgive you, inshallah. Yes. Sheikh, if in a country where it's dangerous to wear hijab, then can we subside and wear hoodie cap as a hijab when going out? If in a country, the question says, if in a country where you cannot wear the hijab, can you wear a hoodie cap as a hijab when going out? My sister, if in a country they don't allow you to wear the hijab, then you got to leave that country. This is when it becomes felt upon you to make hijrah. 
people ask, when do we have to make hijrah? Hijrah was to migrate to a better country, to a Muslim country. By the time the country, or you fear of wearing a hijab or praying in jama'ah, at that moment, you have to leave the country. You cannot leave there. Why would you live in a country where they're not allowing you to wear the hijab? Why would you live in a country where they're not allowing you to pray Salat al-Fajr? In that case, you leave the country. But if in a country that they allow you to pray, they allow you to wear the hijab, they allow you to do your, 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 your religion rituals, that's totally fine, even though it's in the West. It's called Bilad al in accordance to the religion. If ever a country abstain you from doing all the hijab and the prayer, it's called Bilad al-Kufr. Bilad al-Kufr is the, the country of Kufar, then you have to leave that place. You shouldn't be living in that place. No matter how you substitute, so now whatever happened now, you're going to be living in a, in a, in a kind of, of, of place where you're not able to wear your hijab. You tell me now you had to wear a cap or a hoodie cap or a hijab. You got to do th something. Allah says, Fattakullah mustata'atu. Maybe you're not able to, 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 to migrate to another country, maybe because of poverty or whatever. Then you had to fear Allah as much as you can. You fear Allah as much as you can. If you had to wear a hoodie cap, you wear a hoodie cap, whatever. But the thing is, if you're not able to wear hijab in a country, you know which country I'm talking about, then you have to leave that country. Allah make it easy. Oh, I'll be long on here. Anybody got any question? They would like to unmute themselves? Or they would like to share something? No problem. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Yeah, um, if you arrive the masjid and uh, it's already time for subot prayer, can you do the uh, nafila after, after yeah. the prayers? Yeah. The Immediately question. or when? I know. The problem, uh, one day, one day, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw a Sahaba or a Sahabi, he was, he prayed after Salat al-Fajr. He prayed after Salat al-Fajr. And then the Prophet asked him, what is that prayer? He said, Ya Rasulullah, for verily I missed the Sunnah before. Fajr. But the Prophet kept quiet. So the ulama says, whoever has missed the two rak'ah before Salat al-Fajr, then they can replace it after the third prayer. Okay? If you miss the Salat al-Fajr, the Sunnah before it, then you can pray it straight away after. The Imam had done the Taslim, Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. And then you read yourself, Allahumma anta astaghfirullah, 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 Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam, tabarakta ya dhal jalali wal ikram. And then you get up, you get the back, you pray two rak'ah of Sunnah as replacement, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Shukran. Another question? Uh, there was a question in the chat now. Let me read it. Hijab means simplicity and modesty. And it is true that once a woman promises in her intention that she wears for her lifetime permanently, means hijab, once worn, should be worn perfectly correct. Otherwise, do not wear it with confusion and intention. No, uh, she's asking if someone has confusion in his intention about hijab. Hijab, let me tell you something. I, people should know, shouldn't know fear of wearing the hijab. Or well, I mentioned that, okay, we're speaking about it. The hijab is, is the same way Allah has asked you to adorn yourself with your, with your dress. 
and your part of your dress if you wear the hijab. It's simple as like that. Today we fear of wearing the hijab because of the Western culture. Even back in the days, the British at the time, the Ottoman Empire, the ladies used to wear a scarf. It's now recently that the scarf has been removed. It's now recently that the scarf has, been, has come the sign of extremism, recently. But back in the day, scarf was something normal. It was part of the dress of a lady, the dress code of a lady. Even at the time of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, the Bani Israel and the, 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 the many of the Arab before they used to wear the scarf. Even the nuns start where they wear the scarf in the in the masjid. It, sorry, in the church. I mean, why did when it comes to Muslim, we start thinking twice of wearing the hijab? Oh, you don't want to wear the hijab? Why? Oh, I need to get married, brother. I can't wear the hijab now. But the more you don't wear the hijab, the more you're not gonna get the right person to marry. I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, which religious brother or, or, or practicing brother going to marry someone with no hijab? Well, they might do it, but the thing is, when I when we tell the sister, why don't you wear the hijab? They're like, oh no, I need to get married first. If I don't get married, if I don't, if I wear the hijab, I'm not going to get anyone to marry. Who said that? No, that's totally wrong. The more you think that way, the more you're not going to get the person you're looking for. I mean, if someone wants to marry someone, you're going to make sure, okay, you want to marry someone with hijab. So, or the sister wearing hijab over there, or come on, I, I, I want to marry her because she's wearing the hijab. If you're not wearing the hijab, you're going to get people who don't want the hijab is, they are the ones going to come propose to you. This is something that we need to put in our mind. So wear your hijab, be the person, the, uh, that's the identity of the Muslim, eh? And Allah will send the right person. Because you don't, because the hijab, you're going to be covering your hair anyway when you're going to be put in the janazah. Don't let that day of you being in the janazah, the first day of you covering your hair. No, cover your hair in the dunya. You'll be modest in the dunya, the akhirah. It's sad for me to see sisters going out there without hijab. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it either and all of us. Don't think it's, it, it, it's, it, it's hard. If other sisters are doing it in the summer, in Dubai, 50, 50 degrees outside, then I think you can do it. You know, I got this in my head as well, sometimes for like from, from seven o'clock until three thirty in my work. I don't complain. <laughs> you got to wear your hijab, and I got that in my head as well. So listen, you got nothing to worry about. Each and every second you wear the hijab, my sister, you're being rewarded. It's ibadah. Each and every second you wear the hijab, it's ibadah. Uh, you wear a hijab as ibadah, you're being rewarded. You're being rewarded. This is, this is the, 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 the balance of the sister, the Yom Al-Qiyamah. They deliver the baby, they're being rewarded as shaheed. They breastfeed their baby, they're being rewarded. Each and every second they wear the hijab, they're being rewarded. Even on the Wednesday, they don't pray, they're being rewarded. They are on the Wednesday, they don't make siyam, they are being rewarded. Allahu Akbar. This is, you know, mashallah. So if Allah has given you that daraja, being the mother of the house, the wife of the house, the pillar of the house, the, 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 the maker of the leaders, you mothers, ladies out there, MashaAllah, yani, you, you know, you had to say Alhamdulillah. May Allah mm -hmm. make it easy, inshaAllah. And one other thing that I did not, I didn't mention over there, which is your Quran, my brothers and sisters. Do not neglect your Quran, and we're going to speak, inshaAllah, about mm -hmm. how the Quran can make our life, inshaAllah, a better life. The Quran, constitution, our book of regulation and law and rules. How can that be, inshaAllah, a change in our life? that can make us be upon istiqam, which is first and foremost. Sheikh? Sure. Um, um, just a quick question about what you just spoke about with hijab. Um, and you said that sometimes you have people who are non-Muslims or in Western world that has an influence on how 
you know, Muslim women or to dress or whatever. But sometimes, you know, even our elders are in the wrong. Even our elders sometimes when you make a decision and you say you want to cover up and they say, what, you want to cover up? Who told you? Why are you doing this? You won't find a job. No one would love you. And they themselves are Muslim. Muslim women themselves yeah. are sometimes older. So how do you deal with them with respect? Because sometimes I can tell you it's quite frustrating. I remember me and my um, hijab journey when I said this is what I want to do. And subhanAllah, the older ladies who themselves are praying and all that sort of stuff. And my, my colleagues were non-Muslims, but didn't care. But there were the Muslims in my family that told me, don't do it, you're not going to find anything, this and that's going to happen. And subhanAllah, three years and I never regretted it. So how do you deal with them? First and foremost, it does happen. It might even come from your own parents. It might come from your sister. It might come from the people whom you thought they would support you. Yeah. But in reality, you find out they're not supporting you. In that case, my brothers and my sisters out there, remember that you doing any kind of Allah's command is not going to decrease nothing from your risk. Not going to decrease anything from your lifespan. Nothing going to change from your qadr. If ever you are going to the path of Islam, therefore, you wearing the hijab, whatever you get, is what's written from Allah. If ever you wearing the hijab and that job don't want to take you, you don't belong there. If you're wearing a hijab and that man don't want to marry you, you don't belong to that man. If you're wearing a hijab, that country didn't want to take you because you don't belong there, because Allah don't want you to be there. So therefore, something that we already know as a sister, I'm wearing the hijab for the sake of Allah. There are people who are going to take me and people who are not going to take me. Those people who are going to take me, there are the people of success, they are the people who Allah wants me to be with. They're my happiness. And alhamdulillah, it is something that clear cut. If I've got my hijab on, those people accepting me, that's great. There's no hypocrisy in there. But the, unfortunately, we've, we've got the concept of, okay, you got the hijab, people are going to think that you're extreme. You got the hijab, we're going to think you're religious. You got the hijab, we're going to think that you are those kind of, of, of uh, not easygoing person. The people who come to us and tell us that we need to advise them, the only thing. Because number one, we should not obey them, even though they are your mother. You cannot obey them if it is in something that leads to the disobedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. No matter what they tell you, don't wear it, don't wear it. What if? Because you cannot listen to people and displease Allah Azza wa Jal. Displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then pleasing other people is going to be responsible on Yom Al-Qiyamah. So you're trying to tell me, or the people, or you're trying to, okay, mom, or dad, or whoever, uncle, so I'm going to remove my hijab and go work there just to get the risk of the dunya. That place is temporary. I mean, Allah is going to ask me, how did I get my risk and how did I spend it? So I say, yeah, Allah, in order for me to get the risk of what you have proportioned for me, I had to disobey you, Ya Allah. It didn't work like this. Mm -mm. No, no, no. You're a Muslim, you keep your identity. Mama, I'm a Muslim. Allah has asked me to pray, to give the zakah, to make the siyam, to make the hajj, and to wear the hijab. I can't do four and leave one out. I'm going to do all of them because I want to be a complete Muslim. Whoever I get, whatever I get is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, if it's from your own family, you need to advise them in a very, very nice way. They need, their mind need to be open because unfortunately, maybe they're not aware of the consequences of refraining from hijab. They're not aware of the consequences of, uh, of displeasing Allah Azza wa Jal. Because especially our senior in the house, they think of our, they think of our well-being. You know, it's too, you're too young, shouldn't be doing it now. When you marry, when you grow up, you do it. No. No. Oh, because we can die any time. And then what the mother or the father going to be thinking? Oh, subhanAllah, she wanted to wear the hijab. And we never allowed her now, she already gone to Allah Azza wa Jal. La, abadin. The time your daughter wants to wear a hijab, support her. Nothing going to happen in university. Nothing going to happen at work. 
if something happened, that means they don't belong there. So what can I add Allah? Yeah? The main, the main, the main thing is to educate them because they're not aware of it. Both when we are, especially in the West, when we are in the West, definitely we are. What what we've been fed, what we've been fed, in regard to the BBC and the CNN and the Fox News, is all about Islam being maligned, being looked down upon. So when people who are not who do not have much knowledge about Islam, they take those news broadcaster as the source of knowledge so this is what happened so therefore i'm not going to have this uh with my my son or oh, my son is growing a beard or oh, my son don't grow a beard you know it's not good don't grow a beard people are going to look at you in this way did that no 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 do it for the sake of allah and allah will protect you you cannot protect yourself from other people don't leave for people Look at yourself, how you are in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal, in the eyes of people. Because our religion already tell us to be moderate. We're not extremists. We're not extremists. People think we are. We are not. We are medium and people that, like how we said, istiqama. Not extreme and not shortcoming. Straight. Medium. Huh? And not too long lecture, uh, she's telling me. Uh, she's telling me uh, my lecture uh, is too long. Okay, brother, I'll brother. Sorry, sorry. Hello, Sheikh, brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, uh, I have a question here uh, in regards to hijab. Is it compulsory that uh, we women or sisters, we should wear along with hijab, uh, nakhab, uh, hand gloves and socks? Also, does that come under the hijab category? Could you please explain on this? I want some light on that. Yeah, no problem, no problem. The topic was the hijab today, but anyway, that's fine. Uh, okay, great. Uh, in regards to niqab, uh, my sister, is uh, there are a different opinion in regards to the, uh, to the niqab. Uh, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, if I tell you the two hadith where when Aisha radiallahu anha brought Asma uh, with Abi Bakr, she was wearing a dress that was kind of transparent. But Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned his face and then he told Aisha, uh, you know, uh, when someone has grown up, then everything has to be covered except the face and the hand. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the lady during Hajj time to cover everything except the face and the hand has to be uncovered. And we know that when we pray, the face and the, and the hand has to be uncovered. So from this, the ulama says, covering the face is something preferable, but it is not wajib. It is not mm -hmm. wajib. And personally, I take this opinion. Yeah, I take this opinion. For, my, my, my sisters don't don't cover their face. My wife cover her face. So it's something that uh, you can, it's something that you decide, it depends upon the society where you are. If you feel that you want to cover your face, you cover your face. If you feel you, you do not want to cover your face, you don't cover your face, but you make sure that the clothes that you're wearing is not attractive, simple. Mm. It's, not, it's not attractive. No makeup, the kind of makeup that you wear that are, uh, are very attractive, this shouldn't be worn. If you want to wear your makeup, Makeup, no, nope, wear it the way in the cup. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so the hijab is that the fact that you don't get attraction, uh, uh, it's that you, uh, from the, from the eyes of other people. This is the, this is the purpose of hijab. And even your voice is the, you know, when you, for example, when people go outside, there are some ladies that beautify their voice in order for, for men to be attracted. And this is hijab as well. So if you speak to someone normally, like how you see her speaking now, that's totally fine. But in some people, they go outside, you know, they beautify their voice, they make their voice, you know, to attract the men. This is again the hijab as well. So this is part of hijab. Everything that brings the barrier between you and the trial of non-mahram men, this is hijab. But my personal opinion is that for me, niqab, uh, niqab is recommended and it is not wajib. And the other scholars that say it is wajib, but the opinion that I take is that it is not wajib Allah Ta'ala A'lam. 
So it's upon personal choice, uh, Sheikh. Yeah, definitely. The, the, hijab, the hijab is composed, definitely. Yes. So when it comes yes. to the niqab, it depends which opinion you take. For me, I, I go for the opinion, especially knowing that, you know, we're living in a place where multicultural and uh, it's not uh, no uh, clear cut uh, that it is something. Uh, if all the scholars would say that, well, it is uh, wajib, I would tell you it's wajib. But we had different opinion and I've seen the evidence where they come from. And I would say I will go for the opinion that it is not uh, compulsory. Right. It is. It is, uh, of course, the hijab is compulsory, but the niqab is something that it is recommended in the latter hand. Then what about the gloves and the socks, brother? What about that? Uh, the gloves, you know, your hand your hand is not aura. Your hand can be shown. Hmm. Yeah? But your feet okay. have to be covered. So you see both oh. the hadith that I mentioned, the problem is spoke about the face and the hand. Oh. That can be... That can be... Uh, that can be... Uh, shown and the feet has to be covered all the time in front of the mahram yeah every time okay every time but in front of the even when you pray yeah okay so okay. from the, no, even in from prayer the, also socks should be worn yes 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 even and in, in that prayer. case at home also at yes home yes oh. yes when you pray the only two things that should be uncovered is your face and your hand your feet has to be okay. covered Suppose if uh, we forget means our prayer is not accepted, is if that you something? Don't, if, if you do not pray while your feet, because your feet is part of your aura. Mm -hmm. One of the mistakes that everybody does. Uh, everybody do. Anyway, it's something <laughs> that we need to, the sister need to cover their feet. Uh, you do, it's a misconception, especially in subcontinent. Uh, they just go to, they go to the masjid or you see them praying at home with their feet uncovered. And this is wrong. Very, very wrong. So the women, only their face and their hand can be uncovered in salah. Their feet has to be covered. Either they wear the big dress that cover their feet, or they wear the normal dress with the socks on. You know, they have the, the dress as well, yeah? The yes. prayer dress. You can wear the long one that cover your feet, no problem, inshallah. And one other thing, the wearing of the gloves is the sisters, for example, they like to wear uh, uh, what you call it, henna, or they have uh, attractive ring, or they have jewelry, or they have uh, uh, nail polish on. So, if at that moment your hand is attractive, then you wear gloves. You go outside because mm. sometimes there are sisters who, for example, they're on the menses and uh, they want to wear their, they want to wear, for example, nail polish for their husband. And then, you know, then they want to go outside to work or whatever. So at that moment, they wear the gloves. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not displaying their beauty. But if their hand is normal, there's nothing like that, then they can remove the gloves, no problem, inshallah. Okay. The face and the yeah, hand. For clean hands, you need no need to wear gloves. Only if the, just no need. the hand, the face and the hand, especially the hand and the face, not something that have to be covered. Wallahu ta'ala. Only feet has to be covered. Okay. Feet and has with to be the covered all the time. In the house and the house. Well, yeah. But if you're in the house, in front of your uh -huh. mahram and your, and your yeah. father and your husband, this can be, you know, they, they, then you can uncover your 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 feet, inshallah. No problem. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Okay. Shukran. There's a question from the new Muslim in the books. Assalamu alaikum. I am... Um, because Muslim, if I lost to pray, Allah can forgive me. If not, the right word in Arabic because I'm learning, Allah forgive me. Yeah, brother, whatever you do, first of all, if you're a new Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already forgiven all your sin. If you're a new Muslim, Allah has forgiven all your sin, and then Allah has changed your bad, your, your sin into good deeds. Number one, number two. If you want to make tawbah to Allah, make istighfar. Say astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Or you can say in your own language, oh Allah forgive me, oh Allah pardon me. Uh, in, uh, in Urdu, how do you say that? Oh Allah, something like that. Uh, something like that. Yeah, so in whatever language you want to say, it, uh, you can say that, inshallah, no problem. Yep, and <laughs> yeah, Allah, may Allah make it easy, inshallah, 
And I would love to see you all on Tuesday. Tuesday, we're going to have our, our normal class at 8, no, at 9.15, Dubai time. Same, same link. At Tuesday, inshallah, we're going to continue about Surah Al-Fatiha, the tafsir of it. Uh, and you can check on YouTube. I'm going to post this on my, on my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to post the class of Tuesday on my YouTube channel, inshallah. So make sure you can just go in there and check it out in the and make sure that tomorrow, inshallah, hope you have a blessed Friday. Uh, don't forget, Surah Al-Kahf, your peace and blessing by the Prophet وسلم, and your dua before uh, Salat Al-Maghrib tomorrow after Maghrib, after, before Maghrib. And inshallah, until then, I let you all go and have a great evening. And until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Friday, probably next Friday, we're going to start, inshallah, Al Manar uh, session of the Asar. So we'll keep you updated, inshallah. If I haven't said anything, that means there's nothing. The time I send something, that means uh, there's something. Jazakallah. <laughs> <laughs> السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته حياكم حياكم